to go. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, today, we are going to be talking about networking for referrals. So a lot of you um, may be in the position where you're currently job searching, you're looking for a way to apply the skills that you've learned in your nano degree program. And, you know, one of the best ways to get hired these days is through the through referrals. And it's by far the top strategy for um, landing interviews as well as securing the jobs that you're applying for. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump right in um, with a brief kind of overview of who I am. So introduction. So uh, my name is Brett Ellis. I am a career coach with Udacity. Um, I've been here since April of last year. So right around a year and a half. Um, but most of my work, primarily most of my career, I've spent career coaching, um, whether it's through uh, K through 12 or higher education, helping young people figure out what it is that they wanted to do and then helping them get there. Uh, beyond kind of that experience, I've transitioned to start working with um, other professionals professionals, um, leaders, as well as kind of narrowing my focus to IT professionals. Um, when you talk to different career coaches, and some of you may have had sessions with either me or any of the other coaches, um, you'll, you'll come to realize that people have their areas of expertise. And for me, I would consider those areas to be personal branding, showcasing your impact and achievements in, in your work experience, as well as building your presence on LinkedIn. And so a lot of the things that we'll be talking about today will fall into those categories. Um, and yeah, I think out of all the things that I enjoy doing here with Udacity, these group presentations are really um, my favorite part about doing this. Um, and I think it's because it allows us to come together. So much of the, the work that you all have done has been kind of self-directed. Um, and, you know, this is a good opportunity for us to come together. So that brings me to our next slide, which is to give you all an idea of what I'm expecting from you all, as well as what you all can expect from me. So this really is kind of our, our guide to participating in this section. Um, so please, 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 if you can, I would really appreciate it if you turn on your camera and microphone. Um, it's going to allow us to be more interactive. It's going to allow us to engage a little bit better um, and really just kind of, you know, mimic as much as possible the in-person experience, which I don't think that we're getting right now. Um, one quick thing to note that I didn't mention here is if you're not speaking, please make sure that your microphone is muted just so that we don't have any kind of interruptions throughout the presentation um, and just make sure that the, the presentation is fitted for, for everyone. So yeah, if you can, please turn, turn on your um, microphone and your camera. Don't unmute it, just have it on um, and have access to use it if necessary. Uh, one thing that I share with all Udacity students whenever I'm presenting is if you let me, I will talk for the whole time. And I don't necessarily want to do that. I want you all to engage as well. So um, if you feel like you would like to say something or have a quick question, um, you can feel free to use kind of like the, the raise hand feature or you can just kind of speak up as long as it's not uh, disruptive to the rest of the group. So, um, yeah, and then lastly, um, just one thing to note is that, you know, in a lot of these presentations, I know that um, English might not be all of your um, first or primary language, that's okay. Um, one thing that I really express to, to my students and the coaching students that I work with is that you shouldn't see that as a language barrier, even though you might feel that way. What it really is is a bilingual advantage. And so that's one thing just to take note of as you're progressing through your career path is that this is something for you to really leverage. Um, the fact that you can speak multiple languages is a huge highlight to um, really be able to showcase uh, through your job search process. Um, and then another thing is I have a tendency to speak fast if you can't already tell. So if I'm going a little bit too fast, just type in a quick message and ask me if I could slow down a little bit. I'm perfectly um, comfortable doing that as long as you all are gaining what you want out of this presentation. So yeah, once again, uh, please turn on your camera if you can. A large part of this presentation is going to be um, an interactive portion where you all will be, you know, hopefully kind of engaging with each other. And so that's best done through your microphone um, or your camera, either or um, both if possible. So yeah, without 
um, further ado, let's get into today's agenda. So, so some of you all got the notification. Um, well, you got the the description of the event. And um, one of the things that I asked you to do was take a look at a previous webinar. Um, if you have, great. You're kind of ahead of the game. If not, that's perfectly okay. Um, I would highly encourage that you check that out to kind of complement this session. So um, if you did not watch it, um, if you can go to Udacity's YouTube page and actually uh, go to the career webinars playlist, you'll be able to find that one. So that one is the LinkedIn guide to landing interviews without applying part one, um, LinkedIn profile optimization. Um, and then the next thing that we'll talk about is the importance of networking for a job search. So um, those of you who may have been kind of going about this process, we're going to try to make sure that you have a solid understanding of what is working, what isn't working, and how to proceed moving forward. And then we'll talk about best practices for networking. I know most of you know this is something that I should be doing, but don't necessarily know how to do it, um, or might just be trying to reach out to recruiters on LinkedIn and that's not working either. So. We'll talk about things that are actually working for people and how people are really getting hired these days. Uh, and then we're going to do some breakout rooms for some speed networking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a best practice or a tip or something to kind of think about as you're going through the networking process. And I want you all to practice that with each other so that you have a, a realistic um, idea of what that might look like when you do that outside of this specific um, space here and just to let you all know like this is going to be a great place to practice nobody in here necessarily is is going to be judging you or your answers and so this is the place to practice this is the place to ask questions this is the place to kind of really work that those nerves out so that you can hit the ground running when you have real conversations um a question. And, yeah yeah go ahead uh how do you do networking in the age of covid and uh where you can't physically meet people? Yeah, great question. So you're jumping a little bit ahead, um, but great question, definitely something that we'll talk about. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for leading us into that. Um, but yeah, we'll get into those topics specifically. This was created with COVID in mind. It wasn't something that I put together before. This has a lot of those aspects kind of brought into it. So I'll make sure to touch on that question, but great question. I'm sure a lot of other people were wondering as well. Um, I would say social media nowadays, especially in COVID, will play a very important role in networking. Yeah, absolutely. Social media can be a really, really great tool um, if used correctly. And um, LinkedIn is going to be the primary social media tool that I talk about today. Um, and that's kind of going to lead us into our first kind of conversation. So um, what I uh, want to know is... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so can I ask uh, while, while you are presenting if that's okay? So yeah, I just want to make sure that the questions are relevant to what we're talking about kind of right now and not necessarily jumping ahead or individual questions that might be specific to you. Um, if you have those kinds of questions, let's save them till the end. Um, but if they're related to the slide that we're talking about, please feel free to um, ask those questions. Yes, uh, I have a question related to the slide that uh, first slide that uh, I have just seen. Sure. Uh, yeah, the LinkedIn profile optimization. As you have told that uh, uh, we we can watch the video, uh, you know later. But um, if uh, if if that's okay, can you uh, give uh, you know a refresher, maybe of five minutes, uh, so that uh, you know we get we get the space pace up and you know. Uh, go from there if that's okay if, sure if everyone okay with this yeah so i mean basically it's going to be difficult to kind of cover that all within five minutes but i'll do my best to give kind of an overview before um but this kind of jumps into this question so um really that webinar is designed to help you understand how to best position yourself on linkedin so that you are going into each individual section and making sure that you are showcasing the keywords that employers are looking for, as well as putting forth a very consistent brand of what it is that you're looking for. So 
for a lot of people, they'll have their LinkedIn profile and it'll say data science, software engineering, artificial intelligence, graphic design, web design, and it, it can be very um, difficult to figure out like what is it that you're really good at um, and so that webinar teaches you to kind of keep that focus and make sure that the keywords are included in there so that when recruiters are looking for something like data scientist if that's what you want people to find you for you're including that in there um, so that webinar goes section by section and will kind of give you a good idea of that um, once I get some time during the breakout sessions I'll go and find that actual link um, or if anybody else I know there's quite a few people in here if anybody wants to do that that would be great um, it's on the Udacity YouTube page under the videos there's a playlist for career webinars and if somebody could find that and just drop that link in the chat that would be great um, um, or oh yeah Thank, thank you so much for, for, for putting that in there. So if you haven't watched it just yet, I would just say click on it and kind of put it to the side for now um, because you can still fully participate in this session if you didn't attend that event. But now I want to know from you all, if you did watch it, um, if you did kind of go through and, and view that webinar, what are some of your thoughts or questions that you might have had from that? So I have a question. Uh, I watched it like after completing my nano degree because there was that also asked me to watch it. So what if you want to like if you're looking for jobs in different fields like I'm looking for biomechanics as well as like robotics and things like that like if it's a diverse set of fields that you can be fine to work with. So how do you focus your profile in that case because you say like you should focus in one part. Yeah, so I think if it's difficult to focus from keywords, then I think your about section is a really great place to showcase some of that focus. Whereas, you know, some things that are related to what you're looking for aren't necessarily the same things that employers are going to be searching for. So you want to start thinking about your LinkedIn profile almost as if it's like your main hiring page um, and you're selling yourself or you're selling a product to, uh, you know, employers and those are kind of your customers, right? So when you think about that, you have to have an understanding of what is it that they're looking for? What is it that they're searching for? And more often than not, those are going to be job titles or they're going to be specific skill sets. Um, they're not oftentimes going as in-depth as like Python um, or a specific programming language, they're more so looking for software engineering or front-end web development or data scientists, data analysts. And so those are the types of things that you want to make sure that you're focused on showcasing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what other thoughts or questions do you all have? If you don't feel comfortable sharing out loud, feel free to drop that in the, in the chat as well. I have a question. My name is Supriya. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm noticing that uh, I'm seeing less people visiting my LinkedIn profile. I'm okay. using LinkedIn premium services and we generally get insights as to how many people visited your profile, right? And right. Um, I'm seeing that number is going down. Uh, what can I do to improve that viewership? Yeah, great question. So I think the first thing that you want to do, as I mentioned before, is focus on making sure that those keywords are, are there and making sure that they're spread throughout kind of the majority of your profile, especially your headline, your about section, your experience section, your education and your skills. Those are kind of the main sections where you want to make sure that those keywords are present. That's how most people are getting traffic to their page. But if you wanted to take that a step further, what you want to do is focus on engagement and content creation. So that's kind of like the next step. And when I talk to people about LinkedIn, I say that there are really three main areas. One is your profile, which is where most people kind of do it and then leave it. Um, and then there's engagement, which is you interacting with your timeline. So people who are posting content, people who are writing articles and you going in, liking it, leaving engaging comments and not just things like nice and thanks and awesome. 
you're actually contributing to conversations. And then there's the aspect of content creation, which takes it a little bit further, where you're actually writing articles or creating posts related to the work and the expertise that you're trying to build. Those are things that are going to draw more and more and more passive traffic to your profile so that you could potentially even start getting some opportunities um, that you never really even applied for. So people are reaching out to you. And that's actually how I got this role with Udacity. They saw the work that I was doing and reached out. So there's a lot of uh, things that you can do outside of just your profile and the keywords to bring more traffic to your page. Um, but yeah, hope that answers your question. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, I no also problem. have a follow up question if that's okay. If Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I typically have a lot of project work for each of the roles that I have held. So like there's a lot of different kind of work that I have done. So if I decide when I look at my LinkedIn profile, it, everything has a see more section to it, right? Okay. Because there's a lot of things that I covered in there. So how, how, I mean, typically how much does a, how much time does a recruiter spend on a LinkedIn profile? And in order to uh, get that recruiter's uh, attention, how many lines or how much big should that, uh, you know, per job summary be? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, it, it's hard to answer some of these questions because a lot of them, um, certain things like including keywords and creating content and engagement, like that's best practice. Those are things that can be kind of universally accepted as it relates to how much to share and what to share. A lot of that comes down to a matter of personal preference and what works for you. So um, you want to try to focus a little bit primarily on like what is most important. So put yourself in the mind of the recruiter and ask yourself what are they looking for? And then that can help you to kind of take away from things that might be on there that aren't necessarily related to what you're looking for. Um, but yeah, great questions. I do want to move on. Um, as I mentioned before, if, if you still have questions, I'm sure that that other um, webinar will answer a lot of them. And for those of you who are interested in taking that a step further, there's a part two that focuses on the engagement and content creation piece as well. So there's a lot of content that we already have on demand that you can take a look at. But let's get back to kind of the, the focus of this session. Thank you all for, for sharing that. That's going to be a really good um, starting point for you. Um, and then just one thing to note, if you could, I'd like for you all to avoid um, putting your LinkedIn profiles in the chat. Um, for those of you who've done it, it's okay, not a big deal, but I don't want to get um, the messages and the questions mixed up between people sharing their profiles. There will be plenty of time for you to do that um, towards the end. Um, yeah, and thank you, Laura, for sharing the, the second webinar. That's going to be um, kind of the part two to the, the first one that we talked about today. Okay, so now let's talk about networking and why this is so important, because what I'm seeing is that most people are only focused on applying for jobs online. It's the only strategy that they're implementing, and they wonder why they're not hearing back. They wonder why they're not getting responses from employers. One of the main things to know is that most jobs are never even posted online. So a lot of these jobs are being filled through networking and relationships as well as internal um, career fairs, different things like that that are outside of this application process. The reason for that is because I want you all to think about this from a business perspective. Um, if you're working as a recruiter, right? If you're working as a recruiter and you have 250 applications for a software engineering role, how are you going to even decide between that large amount of people? Because there's no barrier to entry in terms of when you can apply, what time you can apply, where you can apply from, what your background is. And so they're getting so many different resumes that oftentimes are not related or not competitive for those roles. So a lot of companies are shifting away from posting their jobs online because that they know that there are other stronger ways to find candidates and save the company time and money. So one thing to note is that a lot of these companies have um, – involved what are called applicant tracking systems. So these are software platforms that companies are using as a way to filter out applications. So if you've been applying using the same resume and you're not getting any feedback, chances are this is why, because those applicant tracking systems are oftentimes filtering out those resumes before a person ever even sees them. And they're doing that through keywords, something that you'll continue to hear through this kind of 
part of learning how to effectively job search. And if your resume isn't matching the keywords of the job description, then you're going to lose out. And oftentimes, even having the best, most ATS focused resume doesn't work when they're focused on hiring through referrals, um, as well as candidate sourcing, which you'll see in the third bullet. A lot of companies, as I mentioned, are shifting away from the online applications and saying, here, talent acquisition team, here, recruiters, here's a job description for a data analyst. Instead of us posting it online and waiting for whoever decides to apply, let's go out on LinkedIn and find, find me 10 people that match this description and then reach out to them and see if they're interested in the role. So a lot of companies are doing this as well as referrals, which, um, and I'm pretty sure this was a US-based study, but I think it's fairly universal in terms of the impact and the importance of referrals and how, you know, this is the number of on average of how people are getting hired. So on average, 40% of all people hired for a job, those are coming through referrals. Um, so it's just something really important to think about. And if you're not doing networking, that's why we're going to focus this session today um, and giving you kind of a specific strategy and things that you can implement to start doing that. Because a lot of people will either kind of wait until they need to make a job transition or until they want to change jobs to then start networking. And so we want to look at it completely different from we're just doing this to get a job and focus more so on this idea of long-term career success and think about it more as maintenance, then I have to cram it into this three months that I'm trying to make a transition. You want to continue to do these things over time so that when you are ready to make a transition, you already have a network to kind of pull on. So there's so much more benefits to going um, and networking for the long term of the entirety of your career. Whereas focusing on apply, 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 apply and cast a wide net, that provides you with no benefits beyond that job search. And if you don't get an interview or don't get a job offer, all of that time you spent applying online was wasted. Whereas building relationships is always an investment and a good investment of your time. You never know where some of those relationships will lead to. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this might look familiar to some people. So this is kind of what I see. This is most of the calls that I'm getting, the, the career coaching calls that I'm having with Udacity students. And I'm asking them, what is your job search strategy? And this is basically what I'm getting. They're scouring job boards, LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, AngelList, wherever. They're scouring these job boards and then they're submitting their resume. And they're just doing this over and over and over and over and over and they're not hearing back. Usually my question is, is why are you still doing it? Um, <laughs> and that's because if, if something is not working, then we want to try something different. And another thing to consider is that if everybody for the most part is doing this, how will you stand out? So when you have everybody focused on this strategy, these are the people who are oftentimes not the ones standing out or having success. It's the people who are doing something completely different um, or doing something to be unique or to stand out in this process. One of the best ways, if not the best way to do that is through relationships. Um, and so if this is what you're currently doing, that's okay. This is normal. But if it's not effective, I want you to take a break from this strategy for a while and try something a little bit different. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from continuing to apply for jobs online, but that's not what today's focus is on. Um, and if you think about it, just in terms of from a numbers game, it's an ineffective strategy. Um, not everybody's going to get those positions if 200 plus people are applying for them. It's going to be one person. So think about the percentages there of, of, of your chances. Um, so we want to lean away from this strategy. If this is something that you've been doing, now you know better. Um, and we're going to try something a little bit different. So this is the strategy that I want you all to start implementing, or at least trying, um, because this is where I've personally had success. This is where my students are having success and, and, and people that are providing career advice. It's not necessarily this model. This is something that I put together, but for the most part, you'll start to see the same things. Um, so the first things first is you need to know where you're going in order to get there. And if you're just applying wherever, you're never going to make progress towards that. So what you need to do is really refine and find your focus. So that's step one. That's going to determine how we put together your resume or your CV. That's going to determine how we put together your LinkedIn profile. That's going to determine the conversations that you're having in networking opportunities. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, it's important for you to have a very clear focus about the types of roles that you're interested in. And I know because I'm one of those people um, that a lot of people have varied interests. There are different things that they like to do. There are different things that they're good at. But as it relates to a job search, you are better off focusing and having all of your materials focused on kind of one area, maybe two, three, I would say is pushing it and that's max to what you're looking for. So you don't want to say, you know, I'm looking for a data analyst role, but I'm also open to a backend developer role and I could also do digital marketing. You know, you want to be focused. And if you are going to include multiple different things, they should be somewhat related. Um, so you may say, you know, I'm looking for either a data analyst role or um, a data scientist role if you have that skill set. Um, or you might say, you know, I'm either looking for a data science role or a machine learning engineer role, you know, things that may be a little bit more closely related. It's okay to, to do that, but you don't want to go too far off because think about it. If you are in the position of hiring, are you going to hire the person who says that, you know, you have an opening for a front end developer? Are you going to hire the person who says, I am a front end developer? Or are you going to hire the person who says, I'm a front end developer, I'm a data scientist, I do this, I do that, I do all these things. It kind of dilutes that specific skill set that they're really looking for. So you want to have that focus, at least for your job search. Once you get that role, you can say whatever you want. Um, <laughs> because at that point, it's, it's up to you and how you choose to brand yourself. But that's really important, at least for the job search part, because people more often than not are looking to hire specialists rather than generalists. And so um, it's important to, to keep that in mind also where you're targeting. So if you're looking at startups, they may be a little bit more interested in somebody with a varied skill set because you might be required to, you know, wear multiple hats or be involved in multiple areas versus a major company. You're probably going to be focused on one specific task with one major project versus doing a lot of different things. So you have to know where you're going in order to really focus your branding to appeal to those types of employers. Well, um, I see that there is a question, Sh Shakar. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mohamed Rizwan, and uh, I am a lecturer at, uh, at one of the leading universities in Pakistan, and I'm teaching uh, engineering courses. Okay. But uh, I have done my uh, data analyst nano degree uh, recently, and I want a transition of the job from one profession to another profession. So I'm really confused how to apply it. I mean, watch, uh, either I should write a title that I am, I have done data analyst nano degree. Is it ethical way to apply? Because I, I haven't uh, done any job like that, but I am applying for the first time. So is it okay to write data analyst in my title? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important for you to do that. One of the things to keep in mind is that if you can analyze data, you can call yourself a data analyst. You don't have to have a full time job title officially for you to be able to say that about yourself. You know, most entrepreneurs or people who start their own businesses aren't able to do that unless they claim to be good at that. So it, you have to have that confidence in yourself to be able to say, I am a data analyst in order for me to want to hire you to be that. You know, so if, if, if you're lacking the confidence to express that, I'm going to lack the confidence to hire you for that role. Um, there's, there's nobody that's, um, you know, auditing LinkedIn profiles and calling your employer and asking you what you're doing. Obviously, you don't want to lie and you don't want to over exaggerate. But if you analyze data, it's okay to include that in your headline that you're a data analyst. Um, and going to your point, what a lot of people will do, let's say, for example, um, you know, you, you, somebody wants to be a, a data scientist and they're a math teacher. What a lot of people will do is they'll say like math teacher aspiring to be a data analyst and you want to flip that to say something like data analyst with a specialization in math education or with a background in math education or something like that. So you're putting forth what you want. That's the only way to start getting attention for the things that you want is to start putting it out there and claiming that for yourself. Yeah. Um, and Shakar, you had a question, I think. Uh, so my question was like, so uh, about finding my focus, like should the focus be according to what you're interested in or what you, like, what do you think that your uh, previous experience would entail if you don't have a job right now and you want to find a new job after graduation? 
Yeah, absolutely. You can't just put something out there and expect that people are going to hire you that, you know, putting that out there and listing that in like your headline or in your about section, that's just to get the attention. But once they're there, if you can't sell yourself and your experiences, then you're not going to get hired anyways. So it's, it has to be a good mix of both. You have to target things that you're qualified for as th those have to kind of overlap what you want and what you're qualified for. Those have to go together frequently um, if you want employers to take you seriously. So the idea of putting it out there is really more so to draw attention. And then hopefully your experiences is what really brings it home and sells it to the employer that's getting to your page. So uh, a follow-up question would be like, if uh, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, like I did master's in mechanical engineering. And, and then I also, I also did a nano degree on AI programming with Python. So I, I don't have like AI experience other than that degree. So is that like good enough experience to say that I want to go in that direction or not? Or like, do I need to get uh, more projects and like uh, before that? Like, how do how do I decide? How do I know that the experience that I have is enough or not? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's very common that I'm, I'm getting these, these questions from students. So it's, it's a great question. I would say the best bet for you is to start looking at job descriptions online and kind of measure up your experiences to that. So if you're looking at those positions, are you even qualified for them? Because what a lot of people do is they go into this process and say, um, you know, they only think, can I convince them that I can do this job? They forget about the part of being competitive as well. And there are really those both sides. You can't just say, you know, I'm qualified for this role. I deserve it. If you're going up against a hundred people who have the same qualifications, if not more, then you're, you're not giving yourself the best chance possible. That's where this strategy that, you know, we're presenting on today, it, it really comes into effect because realistically there are plenty of people with master's degrees that are still out there job searching. And then you, you add another layer of difficulty with the pandemic and how that's affected the job market, how that's affected business. And so, you know, it, it's like how you're, you're counting kind of the things against you. So trying to be competitive with just a piece of paper is going to be very, very difficult. Um, and so that's why you want to focus on the relationship building piece so that you stand out from your relationships um, because your qualifications may be kind of average um, or even slightly above average, most of the time people are going to hire people based on the trust that they have, that they can come in and really hit the ground running, which is important these days because so much of our work is online. Uh, but yeah, I want to make sure that we can continue to keep going. Um, if you still have questions, let's save them towards the end. Um, but yeah, I'll try to make sure that I'm answering questions as we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, will this job stretch? Should I, will this work for internships as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, internships, very similar. You still want to be doing this, especially as a, as a college student. Um, you should be doing this throughout the time period that you're in college so that when it is a time to apply for those internships, you're really focused on building relationships with people at those companies. That's what's going to put you over, give you the edge over everyone else. So after you kind of refine that focus, you want to put together a list of target companies. And there's so many different things to think about here. So oftentimes, you know, and this is just a little bit of tough love for you all. Oftentimes, most of the Udacity students that I'm talking about, I'm um, talking to, they want to work for Amazon, they want to work for Google, Apple, Netflix, Facebook, all great companies. However, if you are not the top technical talent in the world, it's going to be very difficult for you to land jobs at these companies. You're not just competing with the people in the Bay Area. You're not just competing with the people in the US. You're competing with people across the world. And so you have to be self-aware enough and realistic enough to say, do I even compete for these types of roles? I know I can do it, but can I compete for a software engineering role where they're hiring people who have already been doing this work for three, four, five years? And it's okay if you don't feel confident at that point yet there are more than just 10 companies in the world and just because those are the most successful companies in the world does not mean those are the best places to work so it's okay for you to take a job at a company that you've never heard of or that you've recently discovered because once you get that experience it puts you in a place to be more competitive for some of those uh, better known um, higher paying you know what I call sexier companies so 
take your time, you know, be realistic and work your way up. So many of the students that I talk to want to skip all of these steps and jump directly from college to like data science, data scientist role or jump directly from, you know, a nano degree to a engineer role. And, and while you might ha have the knowledge or the skill set, you lack the experience. So be realistic and think in mind, you know, what, what can I qualify for, but also what can I be competitive for? And so if a lot of you are starting out or don't have a lot of experience to back it up, you want to focus on probably some of those smaller, safer companies, especially now when we're dealing with the pandemic and competition is kind Kind of through the roof for a lot of the competitive roles. Um, so just be realistic and, and, and know that you have an entire career ahead of you. There's no rush for you to jump into the top companies at the highest level that you can get to. Um, there, there's no rush. Let's take our time. Let's look at it as stepping stones and pieces to eventually get there. Uh, let's see. Um, I see people talking about um, adding actively seeking opportunities or open to work. Um, so there's a lot of different there's a lot of different opinions out there about that. Um, you know, some people will say, yes, it lets people know that you're looking. Some people will say, if they know that you're open to work, they, that seems a little bit desperate. It shows that you're not in demand from other employers. So I, can't I can't give you an answer because I don't think that there's a right one. Um, I think you know a lot of this has to do with you know taking the advice that I'm giving you, taking the advice that you're reading, and making a critic a critical you know do some critical thinking and make the best decision that's right for you um, because that isn't necessarily, there's no right or wrong answer as it relates to that. I haven't seen any studies or research that has shown one way or another. Um, but based on what I've seen, I think you know just do what's most comfortable for you. Um, okay, there are a lot of questions coming in. I want to make sure that the questions are related to what we're talking about so we don't get too, too far off topic. Um, so yeah, let's continue to go through this strategy because I think this is really one of the most important parts for us to get through today. Um, so you have your focus in terms of the types of roles that you're looking for. You're creating a list of companies that you can use um, to kind of start putting together, like, this is where I'm going to focus my networking efforts. At that point, now you have the end in mind. You can see the mountaintop. You can see the finish line. Now we know where we're going versus just kind of going aimlessly and not really knowing we have kind of an end in mind that we can work towards. So very, very important that you put together that, that list of companies. Um, one thing that I will make sure that I include once I get a second is I'm going to go back and find the template for the company list that I put together for Udacity students. You can use that to put together your list as well as use it as a networking database. So you can kind of keep track of the conversations and the relationships that you're building with people. So that's just the first step. <laughs> and so in between kind of this first step and the second step right in here, you want to make sure that your application materials are together. So you want to make sure that your LinkedIn profile, I would say, is probably more important than your resume or your CV, um, just because you can get passive traffic there and you're getting more views there than you would get on your resume or your CV. Um, but take a look at that webinar, the one we were first talking about at today's session. Somebody dropped it in the chat. Um, I'll try to make sure that this is included in the replay as well. But you want to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is branded well, that there are keywords throughout, and that it shows consistency so that employers can find you and potentially even reach out to you versus you always having to be on the, the more desperate end of the job search. So you want to make sure that those are together because once you start having conversations, you might have someone ask you for that, that you might have someone ask, ask for your resume or your CV and you want to be ready to present that to them. So once you have kind of that target list of companies and you've improved your LinkedIn profile at that point, then you can start reaching out to people at those companies on LinkedIn. Um, and what a lot of people do is a lot of people will only reach out to recruiters or they'll only reach out to HR managers. And that goes back into that same strategy as before. Um, sorry. Uh, this is... This is what most people are doing. So if most people are doing it, most people are not going to have success doing it. So if we go back to this point, and if everybody's reaching out to recruiters, which most people are, their inboxes are going to be flooded with messages. And so you're not going to be able to stand out unless you put something crazy in that message or your CV or your resume is just that much better than everyone else's. And so 
you want to focus on people who are actually within your network. Reaching out to recruiters and networking are not the same thing. What I want you to start doing is connecting with people who are in the roles that you are interested in or in similar related roles because those people are going to have more of a connection with you than the people who are in recruiting roles. If you're talking to a recruiter, they're not going to be able to discuss the ins and outs of digital marketing oftentimes. They're not going to be able to discuss the ins and outs of autonomous systems. And so you want to connect with professionals who are in those spaces on a regular regular basis because they can give you advice on how they got their job. They may be able to connect you with other people who are doing similar work. And it might just be nice to have people within your network who do the same thing. You never know where these relationships may lead. They may lead to you two starting a business together down the road. It may simply lead to you two hosting an event together. Um, and those are common things that I've done as a way to network as well. So it's really about, um, I, every time I tell people about reaching out to people on LinkedIn, I say, ask yourself this really important question. Um, could I see myself building a professional relationship with this person, even if it never leads to a job at this company? And the reason why that's important is because it allows you to approach that conversation and that relationship from a much more genuine perspective. It allows you to approach it from a place of, I'm trying to build this so that it's good for both of us. Whereas if you're only reaching out, basically asking somebody to give you a job at their company, on the receiving end, it, it doesn't get me excited to want to help you. You know, a stranger reaching out to me asking for a referral or a stranger reaching out to me you know, asking me for something that they need. It doesn't, you know, I don't have the time or the capacity to help every single person who does that, especially if I'm working at a top company. So focusing on the people who are doing the work is, is important and approaching it from a genuine perspective so that even if it doesn't lead to a job at that company, it could lead to a referral two, three, four years from now. It could lead to you giving them a referral down the line. And so you want to look at it a little bit different um, than just kind of, I'm reaching out to you so you can help me. It's very selfish. It's, you know, very one-sided. And that's oftentimes why people don't respond to messages is because they don't feel like they're getting anything in return. So um, it's really important that you have that together and that you're doing that as you're thinking of reaching out. And then having that first initial connection is great, but then we move down to this idea of relationship building. And it's not just about having one conversation with them oftentimes. Sometimes it's more about, you know, checking in every other month on that person, asking them how that big project is going. And, and focusing on doing that with your list of target companies so that when we get to that point where positions are available, you can kind of reach out to that person and ask and say, hey, I saw that you all just posted, you know, a, a junior DevOps role. Would you mind sing, submitting a referral for me? At that time, you've taken time to have conversations. You've taken a little bit of time to build that relationship. And that's where you have that ease of asking for referrals. And so I know that this might seem like a lot. I know that this might seem intimidating. Some of the companies on my target list, you know, even when I'm not job searching, I'm still reaching out and trying to build connections. Those haven't provided me with any jobs in the last two years, but there have been some that have happened within less than a month. So the strategy, I wouldn't necessarily change because it just depends on timing and it depends on the level of trust that you're able to build with those people. So when you're thinking about who to reach out to and who to connect with, you want to make sure that you have things in common with that person so that it's easier for you to build that relationship. Okay, let's see. I see that there are some uh, questions. One person asks, is, is this the right time to change the job in this current pandemic situation? That's a great question. I personally, this is a personal opinion, I would say no, um, but we also don't know how long this is going to last. Um, so I think if you're in the space where you have a job that you're okay with, I would say focus on your skill development, focus on building your network, focus on connecting with people at companies that you're interested in. So then again, when positions become available, you can reach out, but it's just, it's a really, really tough job market right now. And so I think trying to aggressively job search or leaving a job that you have to try to find something new is a very, very, very risky. And, and I'm personally not, not that risky, um, especially during a, a pandemic to, to try to do that. Um, so yeah, I see a couple of these questions are very individual. I want to make sure that we have um, some time to get through this. 
So um, I hope that this is starting to make sense in terms of being proactive and doing this throughout your career so that you're not just doing it when it's time to job search. Because if you go that route of applying online, you're going to be frustrated. It's going to feel like you're running in place and not really making any progress. Whereas with this, every virtual networking event you attend is a win. Every meeting that you have is a win. Every new connection that you make is a win. And that's important for you to think about. I had one other question. Just coming back to that original question, other than LinkedIn profiles, what other ways are there for networking? Yeah, great question. Um, we're going to get into that. Um, so we'll talk specifically about some general platforms to use. Um, but those two are kind of, LinkedIn is really kind of the primary one, but we'll talk about um, another one as well. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully this is starting to make sense for everyone. Um, but this is kind of the strategy that we're going to go through today. So hey, I want to hear... This is Anshul here. Sorry. Uh, one quick question, since we are on the strategy slide. Uh, this will be very specific. Like, what are your thoughts on when you want to switch between the industry, like I will be very specific, like from consulting to tech industry. Now you don't have the experience, you might have a skill set, but you don't have experience. How do you attract employers there and relationships, build relationships there? Yeah, great question. I'll answer that and then and then let's move on. Um, so for me, you have to get the experience. There's oftentimes not you can't skip that step. And so if you're trying to get into that space, you know, networking is huge because those are the people that are going to give you the opportunities, but you also can't go through your career expecting that people are going to give you chances every time you need one. So if you want to make that transition, look for the skills and the experiences that are necessary and then find ways to gain those experiences. It may not be through an official employer. It may be through volunteering. It may be through hackathons or projects. It may be through passion projects, nonprofits, volunteering with entrepreneurs or small businesses. There are so many different ways to gain that experience, whereas I see a lot of people are just waiting for someone to give it to them, and they'll end up waiting for a very, very long time. But then also, a lot of those opportunities that you're able to get to gain experience are coming through people that you know. So it's, it's, it's kind of a shift in mindset, the way that we're approaching these things. We can't be passive. We can't wait for people to give us opportunities. We have to go out there and find them create them for ourselves so that when it is time to be competitive we can talk about those experiences because even if you get a referral once you get to that interview process and you say you know I don't have any experience to talk about they're gonna you know oftentimes give you the boot and find the person who's done it before so you have to have that combination of the skill set and the knowledge the experience to back it up through examples and stories and then the networking just to get your foot in the door so all of these things are important if you want to kind of progress throughout your career and those are the people that i'm seeing have the most success so just a little addition to what you respond um there's a website uh, it is recognized globally it's called asec a E I S E C dot O R G. So this website provides global connections uh, via volunteership and internships. And many people, uh, especially living in the third world countries, have found good uh, employment opportunities using that, especially internship opportunities for uh, graduates. So okay. If, if you allow me, can I drop the link? In the yeah, chat I was going to I was going to ask you to if you could please uh, put that link in the chat so that people can kind of pull that up for them for, for for future use. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. Okay, so Let's talk a little bit more about LinkedIn outreach. And then I know somebody had a question about things outside of LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to get to that as well. So um, as I mentioned, when it comes to outreach, uh, one of the things is you want to kind of connect with the people at your list of companies doing this proactively, right? Because if you're trying to reach out and build a connection just because you want a job, those are going to be more difficult. So do this before jobs are even open. Do this before jobs are even available. If you know that there's a certain company that's doing cool things or doing things that you're passionate about or interested in, those can be really um, great opportunities for you to then connect with those people so that when a position does become available, you can pull on that relationship. Um, another thing to do in this step two is one that people often miss out on. So 
when you look at someone's LinkedIn profile, oftentimes between the about section and the experience section, there will be a section for activity if they've been active on LinkedIn, which means that they like posts, they've commented on posts, they've shared posts, or they've written their own articles or anything like that. And the reason why this is important to check is because if they don't have that section there, chances are they're not active, which means they haven't liked, commented, engaged on anything or their activity may say that they liked a post three months ago. Those may not be the best people for you to reach out to because chances are they might not even be active users of LinkedIn. They may not see your message for another two, three months. So focus on reaching out to those people who may have commented or liked or shared you know, within a week or two. Those are people who are gonna be more likely to see your message more quickly. Those are also people who have kind of bought into the idea of LinkedIn and, and what LinkedIn is used for. So those people are gonna be more likely to respond to your messages. Um, another thing to do for step three is take an interest in their work or find something in common. So review their profile in depth. Maybe you went to the same university. Maybe you both completed nano degree programs. Maybe you volunteer for the same causes. Read their about section. Maybe they play video games and you play video games. That's something that you can you know, talk about. Or if they're more of an industry leader, um, you can kind of read one of their articles and use that as a way to introduce the conversation. So type in, you know, hey, I read your article on how data scientists are helping improve the progress of COVID. Here are my thoughts or, you know, ask a question. Those are great ways to show that you've invested time in, 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 in you, um, you appreciate their time and you appreciate their work. It's a great way to start a conversation. Um, and so a lot of times when it comes to LinkedIn outreach, it's not about asking for something right away. It's about building kind of a bond and building some trust so that when you do make that ask, whether it's for a referral or simply for a video chat, you know, a 15 minute phone call, um, those become a lot easier because they know that you're genuinely interested in getting to know them and not just looking for them to help you. Um, and then, you know, as, as I mentioned, try to make that connection. Um, and then here's some things to keep in mind as well that a lot of people think I'm doing this wrong or I'm not doing something right. You will get ignored. Know that going into this, that people will ignore your message. People will not respond to your message. And that is okay. Um, they may not see it. They may have seen it and been extremely busy. Um, they may have seen it and you were asking for something and they weren't able to help you. I've been in each one of those three bubbles before. And so I, you know, can't say that I've responded to every single message that I've ever gotten, but, you know, I have usually, I, you do usually respond to the ones where people are reaching out from a more genuine place, um, or I just have the time to help them at the time. So know that you will get, get ignored. Do not internalize that. Do not say they're not responding because I'm bad or because I'm unqualified or because my profile stinks. Know that it's just part of the process. So it's okay for you to follow up and be persistent with them. So maybe if you reach out and they don't respond, sending them a follow-up message maybe a week later and saying, hey, um, I just wanted to, to follow up and ask. And if at that point they're not responding, I think it's okay for you to move on. Um, so there's no right answer. There's there's no right time frame. Um, it's just, you know, kind of use your best judgment, use your common sense. And if people are ignoring you, um, change your approach, try something different. But really, I think you're going to be most likely to, to, to have success with, with approaching it from a more genuine perspective. Um, um, sir, adding to your response, um, in Microsoft AI scholarship at Udacity, um, I have made an Airtable, I mean, my group has made an Airtable in which we are collecting LinkedIn links and GitHub links of those uh, scholars and students and especially everyone who are interested in making connections with each other. So I have uh, maintained that table in which uh, there are many scholars who have added their LinkedIn links and especially if uh, this uh, group is also looking to add their LinkedIn links or connect with them, uh, they are more than welcome. So if okay. you allow me, can I share the link? Yeah, please do. Please do share that link if for anybody who's interested in, in taking advantage of that. No, I really appreciate every, everybody who's sharing resources and things because one thing to keep in mind is from us on the careers team, 
most of us have backgrounds in leadership, corporate leadership, HR, education, you know, recruiting. We're not technical experts. And so we're not frequently, you know, in all of these spaces. And so, you know, I want you all to take advantage of, you know, each other in, you know, the best way possible. You know, I want you all to share resources. A lot of times, you know, when we're going through the job search process, like, oh, I found this opportunity that's perfect for me. Let me apply and not share it with anybody else. It, you're not going to have a lot of success throughout your career if you kind of keep everything to yourself because at the end of the day it's not something that you created knowledge is not something to be owned in my opinion that's why i love the work that i do anytime i learn something new that helps job seekers i share it because i know that you know the more i'm recognized as a helper the more people want to help me back and so if you have resources, please share those in Student Hub. Please share those in Slack. Please send those to each other. You guys have to do this together oftentimes. This is, you know, a resource for you all to work together. Partner on competitions. Partner on open source projects. Those are ways for you to gain experience without waiting for an employer to do it for you. Um, so, yes, you, you know, definitely um, use each other as resources and, and help each other. Brett, can I ask a question, and please? Just, just one thing, and uh, if, if any one of you are also interested in letting others to make connections with you, uh, everyone is allowed to edit the Airtable and add your LinkedIn link into it too. Okay, so, great. Yeah, no, that's thank helpful. Thank you. And who had a... Uh, yeah, had sorry. A yeah, Brett, um, I've got a question about step four. When okay, go ahead. When you're making a connection, you've got the opportunity to add a note to that connection, haven't you? you know, to yes. request that yep. connection. Is that good etiquette? Because yes. I've been doing a lot of like, um, make a connection and just say, expect people to reply, go, who the hell are you? <laughs> and, and they've replied saying, yeah, great, because I used to work with them. That's what I've been doing before. But now it's like, right, why am I connecting with you? So is right. that, would you, would you recommend that then, adding a note to each connection you make? Yeah, no, I think I think that's best practice. I think sometimes even I don't do that um, just because, you know, sometimes I just want to connect with someone to see their content. And I think that's something that I need to work on is just making that clear, you know, adding a note. And when I say connection here, I don't necessarily mean like that actual button. I mean, like something that you all have in common. Um, but yeah, when you're making that connection request, if you add a note, um, you know, usually when I'm more serious about it, I will include something. If it's like, okay, this person, um, I saw them create a post that I liked, I might just, you know, send a connection request if I'm not, if I don't have the time to just sit there and draft a message and say something. But yeah, I would say if, if you really want to start creating more genuine relationships on LinkedIn, adding that note is a great place to start. Um, whereas a lot of people will use that note to, to say things like, well, they'll make a request or ask something. And I don't think that that's best practice to ask for things from that first message. But yeah, um, I, that's a great question. I would continue to do that if you are. Um, oftentimes that is helpful to then pull something from their profile or pull from something that they posted so that you're not just adding them randomly. Because there are a lot of people on LinkedIn who will just add, 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 add just to increase their follower count. And you, know, you don't want to be seen as that type of person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a question. I'm, I'm really sorry to disturb you again. Um, sir, uh, does endorsement really help in, I mean, getting uh, concreteness in your profile? If, yes. Mean, so the endorsements help, but you're better off having skills that are related to what you want. I would just once again encourage you, if you have any specific questions related to the LinkedIn profile, just refer back to that webinar, um, just because we, we have some other things to get through. And I really, I don't want to discourage people from asking those related questions, but a lot of that is covered in that content. Um, so I would just refer back to that. The endorsements are helpful, but you're better off having a related skill with no endorsements than an unrelated skill with 99 plus um, so make sure that those skills are in alignment with the keywords that you're showcasing and the things that you think employers might be searching for but yeah still a, still a great question yeah okay so 
let's talk about some things outside of LinkedIn. And, and once again, just a reminder, please try to keep questions related to what we're talking about. Um, we have a lot of people in, in the webinar today and I wanna make sure that we're able to get through the content as well as get a chance to practice um, some of these skills. So Meetup is a, an amazing resource. Um, this website is helpful and I know that there are uh, Meetup groups across the world, um, maybe more popular in, you know, bigger cities um, or more well-known places. There may also be other websites that do something similar, but Meetup is a great website for you to find um, specific groups of people. So it's not just professional related, it's not just career related, but it's becoming one of the most, you know, you know, helpful networking platforms out there. So there are meetup groups that, you know, people are involved in that relate to fitness. There are ones that relate to, you know, reading or business, but there are also ones that are specifically related to career groups. So spend some time looking through that. Um, when you have some free time, check out that website, download the app and just browse through there. You'll see these group names, but basically Meetup was designed to help people to gather around a certain topic. So not necessarily professional or, or social, but it can be anything. Um, obviously, Meetup is designed for people to meet up in person and we're dealing with a global pandemic that isn't allowing us to do much of that these days. However, there are some things that you can take advantage of these days because of Meetup. So my first tip for this is to find more specific groups. So, you know, find things that are more closely related to who you are as a person. So as I mentioned in this example, you know, if you're a woman and you're working in the data science field, you're better off going in that group than more of the like broad IT professionals group because that first group is going to give you a group of people who have similar life experiences, people who have similar career interests, and those are going to be, it's going to be much easier for you to build a bond and build a trust there to where they're willing to submit referrals. So um, there's a group that I'm involved with um, that I, I don't think it was through Meetup, but I think they might have one. Um, there's one, and I'm in Atlanta to Georgia in the US is called Technologists of Color. So it's a broader IT group, but it's for people who identify as like a person of color or just want to be involved in that group to learn from them. And so that combines kind of technology, but also a little bit of culture. Um, and so, you know, look for those groups because those groups are going to help you find more like-minded people with similar experiences. Um, I see that somebody posted Facebook groups as well. Those can be helpful too. Um, so finding people who are within the same industry, this is what networking is. Networking is not meeting people so they can get you a job. Networking is not reaching out to a recruiter so they can get you a job. Networking is connecting with people like you and people who are kind of in similar industry for collaborative, mutually beneficial relationships. When you start to see networking as more of that, it becomes much easier. There's not necessarily a huge skill set that you learn to develop and just get good at it. It's more so shifting away from I'm doing this to get a job to I'm doing this to get to know people and build relationships and collaborate and work together and add value. That's where you'll start to see more success. Um, and then another, so tip two, this is actually a benefit of COVID. <laughs> it, it, I didn't think that there were any, but um, this can be helpful because you can join meetup groups in locations where you aren't physically there now because where most of those meetups took place in person, now a lot of them are transitioning their programming and their events to be virtual. So if you really want to move from where you are to, let's just say, Barcelona, you could check to see what meetup groups they have out there. And then you can start engaging with people who actually live there, who work for companies there, who could submit referrals for you there. So you'll start to see kind of how this process works. And that's a huge advantage to going more virtual is that now if you really want to move somewhere, you can start engaging with people in that area already. Speed networking events, panels, webinars like this, um, probably more technical if you're looking into those meetup groups, but um, th that can be a, a big advantage. And then another thing lastly is that some of these meetup groups take it a step further it's 
harder to find some of these. The bigger ones tend to have more involvement, but the, the, the groups oftentimes will have like a private Slack channel or a private place to communicate where you can have more passive engagement. So I have gotten referrals in the past from people that I'm just in the same Slack channel with. Um, and that's because that Slack channel was people in education technology. So it wasn't just a broad IT group. It was a smaller group of people in ed tech. So combining education and technology technology, they're just wanting to help other people in that same space. And that was like, I got that referral within like a couple of days um, of having a conversation with that person. So know that this is not, you know, going to take you years all the time. It's not going to take you five, six months. Sometimes it can happen very quickly, but those opportunities are more likely to happen when you're in groups that are more that you can relate to because you're meeting more like-minded people. You have more things in common. You have that trust kind of already established. That's how networking truly works. And that's how you're going to start seeing more opportunities become available for interviews. So um, LinkedIn and Meetup, I think, are kind of the gold standard right now for networking in general. But you all might know of some uh, more specific tech-related uh, Meetup groups. And then there are obviously going to be tech groups related to specific cultural groups, whether it be women, minorities. Uh, there's a really great group called Out in Tech that, that helps uh, provide resources for people who identify as LGBTQ+. Um, there are a ton of groups out there. Obviously, you know, I don't have access to every single one of them. So it's important for you to also be able to do your own research and, and, and find those for yourself. Um, so yeah, okay. That was most of the content for today. So let's talk about some actual strategies and things that I've worked um, really well with in terms of networking because, you know, once you're able to kind of get that person's attention, once you're in front of them, now it's like, well, what do I talk about? Um, <laughs> or, or how do I interact with them? Or what do, what, what do I say? So now let's, let's take a look um, at some specific strategies and specific things that I've used that work really well um, that you all can start practicing with each other. So this is how we're going to do this. So I think there are four different tips that I'm sharing. So I'll share that tip for how to have conversations. Then I'm going to split you into breakup rooms. I'll probably do maybe, because there are so many people, I would say probably groups of four, um, just because some people might not have their microphone on. Some people might be observing. Ideally, it would be two people, but that's only if every single person on here participates. So I'll put you in about groups of four. Um, then you'll practice doing the specific tip that I share. And then um, we'll go back into the next one and we'll kind of repeat this process. Um, but if, 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 do we have any questions about this before we get started? No? Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So this is kind of my, my best practice part one. So I think a lot of times people struggle with networking because they, you know, pre-COVID, they would attend an event and it's just like, oh yeah, nice weather out here today. And how's your day? It was good. So I want you to ditch the small talk for the sake of small talk. So I want you to speak more in depth. I want you to share things about yourself. I want you to be vulnerable, obviously within your comfort level. So I'll give you an example. So anytime I have an interview or anytime I'm in a networking environment and somebody asks me about my day, I try my best not to just say good and keep it moving. If they ask me about my day, I'll say, you know, today started really great. Um, I was able to go grocery shopping. I meal prepped for the week. I'm, you know, ready to, to be productive this week. I was or I was able to go for a walk this morning or I was able to work out this morning or you know what I mean like so I want you to, to speak about yourself give people things to talk about because if you say something that they can relate to that's how you start to build those connections that's how you start to build that bond um, you could talk about recent successes um, I'm personally in the process of trying to buy my first home so that is something that a lot of people might have in common um, yeah, uh, just some things like that. You could even talk about Netflix shows. It does not have to always be so professional. You don't always have to talk about tech. Sometimes it's just about getting to know a person. So now I'm going to break you all out into rooms. Uh, uh, I have a question. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, what about elevator speech? I mean, 
can we prepare an elevator speech just uh, for introducing ourselves? I mean, in order to start talking, I mean, like many people go towards weather talking uh, when they are really into um, expanding the amount of talk. So uh, how do you suggest I, uh, we all should prepare our elevator speeches? Yeah, so we actually have on that webinars playlist. Um, I didn't facilitate it, but I know Angela did. It was a session on putting together an elevator speech, which I think is great. I want you all to focus on being people today <laughs> and not being tech robot professionals. I want you to just have conversations. That's really what networking is all about. Obviously, having a good network, uh, a good elevator speech is helpful. It's necessary. It's good for you to have. There's a resource there that you can check out for that. Today, I want you to talk about you. I want you to build connections. I want you to get in common practice of just talking to people like people because those are going to be the relationships that you build trust with. Those are going to be the ones that serve as referrals and connections for you down the road. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Did, some, did someone have a question? Uh, give me one second. I'm having some issues with the breakout rooms. Uh, okay. Well, this is part of being an online educator is troubleshooting and improving on the spot. So we're going to scratch the, uh, we're going to scratch the breakout rooms, but I'm going to have you all volunteer. Um, so I have a couple of people volunteer to uh, do this really quickly, um, and we'll use you all as our guinea pigs. Um, so is anybody interested in volunteering? Anybody want to, uh, if you're interested, uh, drop it in the chat. I'm interested. Uh, somebody said the attendance is dropping <laughs> like stock market once they were asked to talk to others. Um, it happens frequently. Um, not a problem. Some people don't have microphones and cameras. It's okay. Some people just don't want to do it. Both are perfectly fine. Okay, so let me see. I will have... Okay, let's see. I haven't heard from Taylor. Taylor Bacchus or Bacchus. And then let's do... I'm just picking these people randomly, I promise. Uh, Cameron, Cameron, K-A-M-R-A-N. So Cameron and Taylor Bacchus. Hi, my name's Taylor Bacchus. Okay, nice to meet you. Um, so Hi. I just recently completed the so product let's management. Let's get that on my camera. Okay. All right, let's go. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Um, nice I just recently you. completed the product manager nano degree. I'm, I have been a project manager for a long time working with creative teams and I'm looking to have better bridge the gap between the two teams when I'm working with creative and the product team. Um, and, you know, since completing that, I've kind of been enjoying my summer, really embracing the opportunity to start cooking more things that I haven't had the time to do before. And then also looking into various types of courses, in addition to Udacity, some language courses so that I can kind of broaden my cultural horizons and be able to communicate with more people. Um, and then even looking into things like grammar classes. Yeah, that's you? great. Yes, that's great. Um, I'm a network engineer and and uh, currently I pass, you know, cloud DevOps number degree and we'll move on in the cloud. Since my last experience is a little bit similar to my future, you know, uh, transition position. And I'm working, but sometimes jumping the cars, you know, I'm trying to make connections on LinkedIn more, I'm reaching out to recruiters. Uh, and if I have time, I'm watching Lucifer. <laughs> On Netflix, I like that. Yeah. You know, serious. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, what's that one about? Lucifer? The Lucifer. Yeah. It's uh, the serial movie, like you know, uh, dramatics, comic comedies. You know, this kind of thing. It's very nice. <laughs> okay, so it's not. Uh, not it's it's just five. If, yeah, it's five series. And uh, they, they're supposed to be to stop, you know, producing the serials, but Netflix 
you know, bought that, uh, the original that fund and, and the Netflix, you know, they're trying to make it, you know, produce that one. Okay. I'll look into it. That sounds awesome. Um, I've been watching Dark, which is a German yes. show on Netflix, which is very dark so far, but interesting. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so are, are you working now currently or? Yeah. I'm not currently working, so I'm looking for new roles. Um, I lost my job during COVID, and I'm kind of just yes. looking on expanding my skill set while I'm looking for new roles. Great. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. You too. So, yes. Okay. So, great. Very, very good. I, I just, I want everybody to get in this kind of concept of, like, Networking does not have to be stuffy. It does not have to be super overly professional. And it does not have to be just to get a job. Um, it can just be conversations. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. So um, now I want you to find, well, and I'll, I'll give two, different, two other different people. So um, I want the next two people to find something personal, not professional, that they have in common. So I'm going to pull from the people, I'm going to, the first two people I saw are Julian Gomez and Kyle Law. So if you guys can jump on, I want you to, as quickly as possible, find something personal that you all have in common. Uh, Kyle Law here. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Julian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> it's kind of awkward. Okay, uh, so oh. let's start from me. My hobbies are basically playing chess. I I playing chess this this morning, and every day, every morning I wake up, I just play chess to refresh my mind. And I recently find a pretty great learning chess website just for anyone if you are interested in learning chess. It's called chessable.com. I pretty much enjoyed a lot of it. So yeah, this is pretty much about my hobbies. Yeah. How about oh, you, Julian? Great, that, uh, great, that's interesting. I haven't played chess in a while, but uh, uh, I guess I will give it a try sometime if you maybe uh, share the website with me. Okay, uh, how about uh, a hobby of mine? Well, <laughs> pretty much I would say, um, I would say I, uh, uh, I, I read a lot of books, uh, I like especially at night. Uh, right now I'm reading this one named uh, um, uh, the uh, Grant Biography. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, sounds interesting. Yeah. What yeah. is it about? Uh, it's, it's about the uh, General, uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he's um, experiments and he recounts his experiences uh, specifically during the Civil War and, uh, and then uh, uh, once he becomes president. Right now I'm still in the middle when he fights during the Civil War. So. And uh, another hobby is that uh, uh, I will watch a lot of Netflix uh, while, well, well, besides uh, taking the time to to learn from Udacity. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I enjoy reading books and learning from Udacity as well. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Let's do two different people. Same topic. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna have Laura and Sharif. Hey, Laura. I didn't volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I thought you did. It's okay. Okay. Well, I'm volunteering you. That's, that's, that's the teacher in me. <laughs> um, I, go ahead. You go first. I, 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 I let you start. Yeah. No, no, you start. <laughs> you okay, <volunteer>. cool. <laughs> uh, so uh, recently I quit my job uh, for my higher studies. So uh, past month, all I've been doing is learning how to cook. So uh -huh. uh, today I learned a new recipe called uh, Khichdi. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's an Indian yeah. recipe. It came out well. What, what's in so, it? Uh, it's just rice and pulses. Okay. So it came out well. So pretty happy about that. And also indulging myself in, uh, so I'm from a uh, uh, data science background, worked uh, in it for three years. So uh, I'm just uh, shifting myself and focusing on web development so that 
as in how be i'm learning so that i can build my own portfolio on that yeah i'm in web development too but we're not going to talk about that cuz we're supposed to talk about personal no no stuff. We'll web development as a hobby the <laughs> non work hobby yeah yeah so what about um, you i i enjoy cooking too i've been experimenting okay. with a uh, pork roast and uh i've i found that brown beer and granny smith apples in a pork roast very very nice cool maybe you can send me the recipe i'll try it out <laughs> okay <laughs> you have to very, all have to pick one up <laughs> very very good very good and i see that some people are like actively networking in the chat as well so if you if there's anything that people are mentioning feel free to jump on okay so now i want to do this again um but i want one person to to come on and talk and then i want anybody who can relate to jump on the call because this is like virtual networking this is how it works okay maria volunteers uh maria i want you to just start talking about some of your passions or your hobbies or your um quarantine activities and if anybody can relate um i want you to jump on hi thanks for giving me the chance to talk i volunteered twice actually <laughs> <laughs> here you go to make sure um so when the quarantine started i thought this is a great opportunity for me to get some of my flexibility in check and get more exercise uh since i wasn't commuting anymore i had more time and i really like yoga i'm really into yoga and i thought i will have time to do splits now i can learn to do splits <laughs> the only thing is i'm also quite ambitious so i <laughs> i kind of injured myself um so it's not a great thing to be stuck in the home without uh, <laughs> being able to see a medical professional for a few months uh but i guess that teaches us a lesson right so don't push too hard <laughs> whatever you're doing um even if it's a hobby uh it's you know take it easy <laughs> that's what i learned um and yeah so i really like um yoga and i like dancing moving as much as possible uh, we're all technologists here so sitting in front of the computer for a long time i think you can all relate um means maybe moving is not a uh, part of your daily routine so much so i'm personally trying to incorporate that as much as possible when i have a free free moment yeah I can see, I I'll jump in. Um so I have so I go through my phases of exercise and working out and I stopped when covid hit cuz I stopped going to the gym and I lost like 12 pounds just from stopping to work out and I know like for some people that's ideal but for me I got skinnier than I wanted to be and so I've been working out again um lately and I think there's just I don't like to do it but i like the fact of already being done with it for the day <laughs> it makes yeah. me feel good about doing something especially in the middle of covid where most of us are just sitting in the house doing nothing all day so i've been going for a lot of long walks around my neighborhood as well i completely relate to that and i think everyone i've spoken to that are even like really into sports and a bit obsessive about sports they say they don't like it it's just the after effect the endorphins at the end that they enjoy mhm mm so, got gotcha. you uh, maria do you have a favorite course that you're doing for yoga or an instructor that you follow yeah um i really like kino mcgregor from om stars and i um, i bought a yearly membership do you know her no what's it called she's from florida um a really well known yoga teacher in the us and she has the website called Om Stars okay. and uh, it's really good for beginners too she has uh, multiple levels but if you've never done yoga she goes through uh, all the details step by step and i'm now doing a journey to handstand <laughs> so let's okay. hope i'm not falling <laughs> um, can i jump into yeah go ahead um well uh not related to yoga but uh when covid-19 hit uh, there was a boom of uh, online courses i took learning as my hobby as my hobby not as a professional thing uh, because i am already doing two masters so uh, making uh, 
you know side learning uh, a part of a profession will be very hectic so i try to uh, consider learning as my hobby so i just i mean blindly took i mean courses and courses and courses and then i was like i mean you can say i was getting exhausted from so many courses that i have took so one advice from my side uh, after this covid 19 experience that i mean if you get any opportunity don't just jump in uh, try to sit down and think for a moment that whether uh, th this activity that i am going i'm going to do is really worth my time in because uh, you know the best thing quarantine has offered us is time i mean free time many of us are having so much free time so uh, it's very crucial for us to dedicate time aside to uh, think about and reflect on ourselves that what do we want and how are we going to achieve it personally speaking uh, before covid 19 i used to get so i used to be so much busy that i never have a time to really sit down and think for myself that what i want from myself and what i want for my future so i would re highly recommend all of you to set aside i mean a, a small amount of time like half an hour or an hour and uh, try to envision your future that okay now i have time let's decide what we truly want from ourselves so that was my story yeah thank you for sharing that message i think all of us could use a good reminder <laughs> to focus on ourselves and taking care of ourselves okay so this is how i want to do the next one so now i want you to talk about something professional um so i want let's see i think mario are you still in here mario hopefully uh let's see um anshul anshul come on come on come on the the uh come on down you're the next contestant <laughs> um okay so i want what i want you to do is just talk about um I want you to talk about your nano degree program, um, and I want anybody who has taken or is currently taking the same nano degree program to jump in and just, I just want to hear you all chat about that program. Sure, Brett, and thanks for choosing me now. Sure. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good. Um, quick background. Uh, so I started as a computer science engineer, then I moved to US, and then I moved into consulting because it sounded exciting. And now I'm trying to move back to the tech industry. That's where Udacity came in because in tech, uh, in consulting, it's mostly, you know, reaching out to people, networking, that what we are trying to do here. And then, you know, doing those small talks, starting a conversation and then letting them understand that how valuable we are and then they will pay you for the project that they want from you. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing. But then now I'm trying to shift to tech industry from consulting and started doing Udacity courses. So I started with a data analyst nano degree from Udacity. Then I recently did a SQL nano degree that I completed. I'm looking forward to a product manager nano degree that they have recently uh, listed in Udacity. So uh, that's, that's next on my list because I'm targeting roles like product manager or data science role, something related to data and metrics and on a daily level that you interact with data that because that's what I'm doing also in the healthcare healthcare right now. Oh, and sure. for my on my skills and expertise, uh, uh, as I said, I was a computer science engineer before this. Then I moved into uh, consulting, but I'm still uh, working on data related stuff. So daily interaction with healthcare data. I was working on some of the projects which are related to COVID-19 right now. So helping some of the big farmers and then well, my career goal moving forward from here is land into a tech industry, uh, some big, like those FANG firm, and then probably own up a product, start some, uh, do some strategy for that product and be a product owner or a data scientist moving five way down the lane, down the lane. So that's, that's my <laughs> career goal. Hopefully I'll be able to achieve that with this whole thing going on. And I attended this event just to 
make sure what I'm doing right now to connect with different people uh, in those uh, target firm, uh, whether my uh, strategies are correct or not, and if I can able, if I'm able to improve the strategy. Um, so that that was one of my goal from this workshop or from this webinar. So Paul, awesome question. And second thing is, uh, which nano degree related to product are you interested in? I mean, there are mainly three nano degrees that are offered. Uh, first one is product nano degree, product management nano degree. Uh, second one is data product manager. And the third one is growth marketing product manager. So uh, among these three of which, which one are you really interested in? I think the recent one that they have introduced, the data product management, because awesome. that uh, calls out to my experience and skill sets more. And as I see with, uh, with some of my friends working in the tech industry, I see that they are more focused towards data. And then when you work on data, um, you can get a lot more insights. And then, you know, you're better able to answer things to both your customer and to the leadership that you are interacting with. So that's why I think uh, data product manager degree is more relevant for me and calls out. Awesome. 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 Hey, Very cool. For your degree. Thank you. Hey, Anshul, this is Supriya here. I too hey, took Supriya, a nano. I'm good. How are you doing? Doing good. Coping up with this California fire right now. It's all over. All ash and brown sky right now so oh yeah. my god yeah we experienced that i am up in portland oregon and we had a wildfire a few years ago and I, though i am miles away from that file wildfire i could have layers of ash and you know all over my yeah. car so yeah cleaning that up is gonna be a mess for you <laughs> yeah anyways my car is all like a dump right now I've, I've not been outside house for like almost three or four months so yeah yeah that's the story with everyone <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry to hear that sorry, yeah. go ahead with your question yeah <laughs> yeah so uh i i mean um my i, I took up the uh, digital marketing nano degree i am a marketing analytics professional and uh, i was always uh, you know, my roles were pro limited to email marketing. And uh, so I wanted to expand my horizon and see what is digital marketing. I mean, whenever I would look up and read online, there was limited resources. And the best part about Udacity Nano degree is what I felt is the ability to have hands-on ex uh, exercises and try it out. And um, it really helped me, uh, you know, gather those skill sets and hone my uh, skill sets as to improve as to where do I want to go though I'm not working right now but I kind it kind of helped me as to which direction I want to head to right. uh, so I wanted to ask you I mean what you've taken up so many uh, Udacity degrees like two or three of them how are you utilizing all that information knowledge in your current uh, profile um, I would be able to better answer you probably in two three months <laughs> <laughs> but thing is it's a good way to start initiate um, you know where you want to head to and it gives you if you don't have understanding if you don't have a baseline it gives you a, a, a base to start thinking from there and uh, yeah i think where i'm struggling right now is as i asked in the question before is the experience so i do those uh, you know capstone projects industry industry level projects and then i prepare i make up my github profile but the thing is uh, I mean, now there are so many people doing those Udacity projects that, as Brett said, you have to stand out, right? So even though doing those Udacity projects, you have the skill sets, standing out is a little difficult now. So what I'm thinking now is whatever I've learned, I'm trying to apply those maybe on some Kaggle projects, doing something on my own. So I have a, I, I do a lot of gaming. So I play League of Legends online and then you know, Counter-Strike. So those are my pastime on weekends because right, there, right. Uh, you can't go outside. So I happen to get access to the data. So League of Legends, Riot Games, they have an API. You can download data from there. So I recently got access to it and then I explored it, that option. And then I'm trying to do some analysis on top of it because it's a domain which I'm very interested in. So that will help me with that data science domain expert experience and then trying to build up a project on that just to show in my GitHub profile that, okay, I have learned from Udacity. Now I'm applying those skills on a interesting project that I'm doing on all by myself. There's no mentorship or mentor or teacher who is guiding me there. Probably right. that will help me stand out. Right. 
Yeah, I wanted to I, I wanted to jump in on Shul because I think you shared a really good example of you know, being able to gain that experience and really develop your skill set. Um, and that's something that I usually encourage to a lot of a lot of my students is find ways to involve your passions, like the fact that you're bringing that into like your passion for, you know, gaming and esports, like that could potentially put you in a position to where you start reaching out to people at esports companies or gaming companies, you know, you know, these these places that are they're putting together these games in a booming industry start building connections there start having conversations about the projects that you're working on related to running that data and making use of it and and showcasing to them your value that may be an opportunity for you to really stand out and have conversations where you're combining multiple interests of yours so it may not happen as quickly and, and i don't know where you know, a lot of times people get this idea that people are transitioning careers within a couple of months. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with like <laughs> the marketing. Um, but realistically, when you look at these nano degree programs, I usually encourage my students, like I want you to focus more so on the skill development and putting together quality projects. Because at that point, like the certificate itself is still very new. Udacity is still a growing company. A nano degree is still, you know, becoming known as what it stands for. So you need to focus on being able to get that confidence. And if that means that you can use that to pull in data from League of Legends or Counter-Strike, I think that that's so cool. And for me, I'm, I'm a gamer too. So that's how you start to build those connections. And, and now, because I know that from you, I know potentially like if you and I were to have more follow-up conversations, if I'm ever introduced to someone in the esports or the gaming industry and they're looking for someone with your skill set, I have you top of mind. So this is where the networking comes in and becomes very impactful and very relevant is when you're able to not only, you know, get those experiences on your own, to me, that showcases a level of autonomy and a level of like being able to self start that I want to recommend you I, you know, and, and because I'm a gamer, I think that I connect a little bit more than people who don't. So, you know, it's, it's important to have these conversations about the projects that you're working on, because that's where you might start to see some value. And adding what said, and, and adding what Sorry, Mohammed, we lost you. Uh, can't hear. Uh, hey, Brett. Uh, like you said, uh, Udacity is still a growing company. Mm -hmm. uh, when we uh, showcase our uh, uh, nano degrees from Udacity, how do you think we should show it? Or like, can we uh, circle our profile around it, or should that uh, nano degree just be a part of it? How do you how do you expect that? That's a really good good question, and that's a really important thing to consider because when you because some people sometimes they'll put on their resume or their CV or their LinkedIn profile they'll just say um, data analyst nano degree to someone who doesn't know what Udacity is or doesn't know what a nano degree is that could mean an hour that could mean a two hour course a two week course a three day course you're not providing the context to show that off so what i encourage people to do is really focus on selling it you know not just me being a udacity employee but you all have to be udacity ambassadors in a sense because you have to be able to sell that experience because for someone who doesn't know about it they're you're, you're making the assumption that they're going to go on Udacity's website, go to that nano degree program, review the syllabus. They're not going to do all of that. The, the recruiters are going through hundreds of applicants. So you have to tell the story that you want them to hear. And so talk about, you know, provide that context. Talk about how long it takes to, to complete, whether that's in hours, weeks, months, whatever. Talk about the overarching modules. That'll help you infuse more keywords into your profile, but also talk about the major concepts of that um, nano degree program. So, you know, a, a master's in computer science, everybody kind of knows in a sense what that does, um, or a bachelor's <laughs> degree, that's more of a, a universal concept. A nano degree or a boot camp or things like that, you know, there's so many people that are popping up with these different programs so that's another reason why I mentioned you know focus on the skill development focus on the projects don't rush to get their certificate because at the end of the day you still have to be able to sell that experience until there becomes some universal standard or some accreditation for these online certificates or the brand just gets that reputable you have to be able to showcase that so I think writing a description on your education section of your LinkedIn profile 
and even including links to your projects, you can start using your LinkedIn profile as if it's a portfolio. Include the links to your projects, include the links to your GitHub repos, include the links to your digital marketing portfolios, all of these different things that you're putting together, sell it, showcase it, because to the average person, they're not gonna know what that means. Sir, uh, I have a question. Uh, in the LinkedIn, in LinkedIn, there is a certificate section Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we cannot provide uh, details of the nano degree program that what right. are, that what are the projects we have done so far right so what is the right way to showcase that what projects you have done uh, either in the about section or whatever you suggest yeah so i would suggest if 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 for those of you who haven't um once again referring back to that first linkedin webinar that'll be helpful but um just to answer your question if you're going to showcase that i say put it in your education because that allows you to write a description that allows you to upload media whereas in the accomplishments or the certifications licenses area it doesn't allow you to do so um so i would say put your nano degree in your education write the description and upload media or include links to your projects that you've completed or also Rizwan what you could do is you can write a post about your project mm -hmm. and uh, provide a link uh, about link of github and then people would uh, like it and share it so you re you reach further so that po writing a post about it is also a good idea yeah, great, great, great comment. And so just lastly, uh, we don't have to necessarily go through an example. I know we're like way over time, but um, you know, this is, this, is, this is the event for the day. So, um, <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of people have done this throughout the presentation, right? But this is probably the best thing that you can do. The kind of one of the big tech takeaways from networking is always, always, always try to add value. And this is something that I say when you're posting on LinkedIn as well, like just being known as a helper, being known as somebody who provides resources, who shares things, it makes people want to help you. And so some people people shared yoga courses, some people shared Netflix recommendations. As I mentioned in the pro tip, it doesn't have to be just professional. It doesn't have to just be focused on nano degree courses or, you know, me providing you with a service or me being able to do something for you. Sometimes it's just about building that connection and finding that it, being known as somebody who helps. And a lot of times, when I was, um, you know, pre COVID and I was really aggressively networking, I would offer to buy people lunch um, or offer to buy them coffee. And sometimes just the offer itself was enough to get a meeting. Sometimes they declined it and just said, you know, I can do 2 p.m. on Thursday. We don't have to meet for lunch. Um, and so just showcasing to them that you value their time, that you're willing to make it a mutually beneficial relationship. That's the most important part of this all. Um, because as I'm sure some of you can kind of attest to, like just some of the conversations that you've had here, you have things in common outside of this, you're all all going through this experience together of COVID, or <laughs> you're all going through this experience of being a Udacity student. And so you guys, I'm assuming, are going to be a little bit more likely to want to help other Udacity students. So it just kind of puts into kind of kind of context some of the things that we've been talking about today and how finding those connections and, and being able to to connect with each other is what's most important. Like the your entire career is going to revolve around relationships because that's what the world revolves around if you're ever interested in building a business if you're ever interested in dating it's all about building relationships it's all you know people focused you know you could be the most technical expert in the world but if people don't like you it's going to be hard to to want to hire those types of people so um that's kind of like the the overall takeaway is just to to try to always add value and make sure that when you're leaving those conversations you've made it clear that you want this to be mutually beneficial you're not just trying to get a referral from them and i think that that hopefully is the biggest takeaway from um this session so now i just want to know if you do have some specific some specific questions um i'm here these can be individualized they can be general as i mentioned um, i'll probably hop off here in like 15 minutes there's there's no rush um so yeah does anybody have any overall questions or anything that they're hoping to get uh, okay let's let's uh let's do this um i'll have you all raise your hand if you have a question just because i know that there are still several I, have, I have a question uh, uh can you please give me a career guidance that uh, i i have done my bachelor's in mm -hmm. engineering and uh, then i have done my master's in electronic engineering 
and then i came to know that okay uh, i want to jump into data science career and i have just start my nano degree programs in uh, udacity and i want job in this in this area for example for instance if i don't get a job should i should i go for a phd in this field uh, what you recommend Great question. So I'm, this is a very common question that I get from a lot of Udacity students. And oftentimes it's the question basically getting down to like generally is like, if I can't get a job, should I go back to school? Um, whether it's for a master's degree or PhD. Um, there, you know, the good thing about going back to school is it puts you in a place where you have a lot more resources. You have access to a career services department. You have access to faculty. You have access to events. Um, you have access to internships a little bit easier than you would outside of that. However, what I see oftentimes is people get their bachelor's degree and they can't get a job, so they go back for their master's degree. Now they have a master's degree and can't get hired because they have no experience. So going back to kind of that previous point that I made, you have to kind of, you have to hit all of these areas. You have to have the knowledge and the skill set and the expertise. You have to have the experience. You have to be able to showcase to employers how you've applied what you've learned. The same thing, uh, same reason why a university graduate is going to have a hard time getting a job without internships or part-time work or student involvement. And then you need that networking to help you get that foot in the door, help you get that chance to show off your skills. So I hate to recommend people saying, you know, go back and get your PhD or go back and get your master's degree when you're going to end up in the same situation where you still need to have that applied experience. Um, a PhD is a little bit different. Obviously, it's higher level, but, you know, there's still that possibility that you graduate with that and they're still trying to find how you've applied what you've done to real world situations. Um, so, and then Sean says, having done a PhD, it's not always the right thing. It doesn't guarantee you a job. It's a much bigger commitment than a master's. Part of the reason why I never went back to, for mine. Um, but just to, you know, kind of go back to your question, like, you know, it's not going to be guaranteed. So don't get a PhD just to increase your chances of getting a job. I would say go get a PhD if you're extremely passionate about this work. Maybe if you want to teach at the higher education level, maybe if you want to do research or become a leading expert. But if it's just to increase your chances of getting a job, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it because um, then you have to think about the financial aspects to it as well. And Brett, if I may add just one additional point to it, based on ahead, my yeah. experience in the last six months of searching a data science job, sure. uh, what I've seen is they really value, this would be really specific to all the data analysts or data science job related things. So they really value your GitHub profile, how you are building mm -hmm. your projects, and then you're listing it on the LinkedIn back to LinkedIn. So Udacity projects are very good for initial purposes, like starting off but then how you're applying it and then building your GitHub profile and showing that again back in your LinkedIn profile and in your resume, like a link is really helpful. And I've seen that with my phone of two of my friends who have landed a job in Google as data scientists two years back, that they had links in their resume to their, to, to their projects and they have built their projects uh, slowly over time. And uh, yeah, that's what they help them get a call from those uh, from those company as a data science data scientist so that's really helped them and that's what i'm trying to do now so yep that's my two cents there hi anshul um, i have a question for you so on the point that you said that uh, we should have a github profile maintain data profile so i think that's not specifically for data science but instead for all data scientists jobs that we are looking for currently in the market uh, Keeping on that note, actually, uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I am working as a data scientist full time, so I don't get much time uh, to like build my GitHub profile, have some personal projects. Even if I do have time, I would like make a project up in three or four months, a viable project. So uh, that would not like count up as a GitHub profile, even if I work for like an year. So how can we like go for that? I'm sorry, Brett, it just addressed to me. So it's fine if I answer that. No, go ahead. Yeah, I'm answering a question in the chat. So go ahead. Okay. So Kanika, I believe, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the points that I recommended was people who don't have experience in data science. So they want to show, so if they're learning, they're learning and they want to show their experience to build up their data profile with you. Uh, I think the advantage is that you are working in data science. So you can readily show that experience in your resume and in your LinkedIn with uh, all those projects listed. So even if you are not able to, I believe if you're working 
professionally on a project, you may not show them on uh, on your GitHub with the codes and everything um, uh, uh, shown to the public. So, but you can list those projects in LinkedIn and your resume because you're professionally working. So you can definitely show your experience there, which I think count as equally or uh, above the GitHub profile when you're doing your personal projects. So I think you have an advantage with your experience as a data scientist work rather than you know personal projects being listed on GitHub. Anshul, uh, Anshul, I have a question from you that uh, uh, as you have mentioned that you are working on data science uh, career. Uh, is it necessary to have uh, to have some skills on developing sites like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Django framework? Should I also learn these things or I should I skip uh, these things and just focus on data science? Um, uh, Brett, feel free to pitch in, but based on my six months, last six months experience, I'm not working on those HTML and CSS. I'm just working on the specific data science project and uh, in the interesting domains that I can uh, find projects on. So I think they are more, uh, they want more, in data science, they want uh, your understanding of the maths working behind the code. So do you need to understand the math that is working on the, in the algorithm and then how you're applying that math uh, correctly and choosing the algorithm correctly to get on a uh, get the insights from a particular data set. So that's what really matters. If you have HTML and CSS, that's like a cherry on top, but I don't think that's required. But yeah, but HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is like a complete package. You can build your own end to end application if you have those skill sets. Yeah, no, I think also, that's important to, to mention too, because, you know, there, and just being realistic about the career services here with Udacity, there's only so much that we can help you all with because we're not technical experts. So I can't answer the same questions that, that you all can oftentimes answer for yourselves. I wish I wish I had the, the, the skill set. I, I uh, am a nano degree dropout, so I <laughs> couldn't even finish the intro to programming. So kudos to you all for, for, for keeping that up. Um, but just but know, I have you know, a question for yeah, you, Ben. Like sure, go ahead. relevant to you. So uh -huh. um, I, I have uh, three years experience in uh, data science field. I've uh -huh. quit my jobs to pursue my higher studies. I'll be going to France in about 20 days. Okay. So I have a year's time. So how do you um, expect me to spend this time like uh, in, in networking and building links? So I have the year's time for my academics now. Okay, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't hear your question. Can you just repeat the question? So I, I said I, I just quit my job uh, recently uh, to pursue my higher education, which okay. is a one year program, uh, MSc in uh, international business. So I'm, I'm going for that uh, now. So how do you expect me to spend this one year in, in terms of uh, networking and other stuff? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And I think anytime you can go into a situation like that, thinking proactively, you're putting yourself in a better position. Because oftentimes what I see with people, whether it's, you know, pursuing higher education or not, they wait until like the February or March before their graduation in May to start applying for jobs and, and doing job search related activities. So as you're going through the, the, the program, meet with all of your professors, connect with the faculty members in the, in the department, ask for referrals to people in the industry, do, do that strategy and that wheel to where you have a target list of companies so that when you graduate in May or December or August, whenever you're finishing, you've already built some of those relationships so that when it comes time for you to actually find a job, you're, only focused on referrals and not submitting as many CVs as you possibly can. So do that proactively, get your company list together as soon as possible so you can start making those connections because think about it like this. If, if you work for, let's say you work for ABC company and I really want to work there. If I reach out to you and say, hey, Sharif, I saw that you all just posted a position. Um, I'd love to chat about your experience. That seems you know very genuine and that's an okay approach some people might be open to it versus me just reaching out to try to get to know you and then i ask you a year from then you know it, it's a different dynamic so you approach the relationship building proactively to where you're not asking them for anything but you continue to follow up you continue to check on them you continue to you know have conversations hopefully the relationship builds that way so that when it does come time for that referral it's it's a it's an obvious yeah i'll help you yeah i'll send you the referral yes i'll do that um so spend that time doing that take advantage of all the resources for any of you who are in school 
my background is in higher education. I worked for a university for several years, several different universities. And one of the biggest things I can say is that students do not get their money's worth. Um, they complain and complain and complain about how much it costs, but they don't go to the career services office. They don't go to career fairs. They don't meet with their professors. They don't attend events. They don't go to their counseling sessions. They don't seek tutoring. So take advantage of it while it's there. People are genuinely there and want to help you. And those are the students that I see have the most success, people with multiple job offers once it's time to graduate. Thanks. I, I that, have that, a question. That, uh, yes, good. Priyanka. Yes, sir. So I wanted to ask what to avoid putting in our LinkedIn profile so that we don't kind of repel the job providers. Um, it cut out just a little bit. I wasn't able to hear. If you could just try to speak a little bit louder and a little bit slower, hopefully I'll be able to get your question. Okay. What should we avoid putting in our LinkedIn profiles so that we don't avoid, uh, don't repel the job providers? Gotcha. So what to avoid? Um, I would say one of the biggest things that I see people do is they complain on LinkedIn. They use that as a place to vent about their job search frustrations and nobody wants to hire that type of person. Obviously, you know, we all have complaints about the job search process, about hiring. A lot of times I'll see people just bash recruiters or talk about how messed up the system is. That doesn't make people want to hire you. Um, I would say other things to avoid. It's, it's hard to say. There's not a whole lot that I would say to avoid. Just, I would say use your common sense. I think it's more so approaching this from a place of like, what should I do <laughs> versus what should I not do? Um, and that, that one webinar that um, I was referencing throughout the, the presentation, I think that that's probably one of the better ones that I've done with Udacity um, and one that I reference all the time. So I would just refer to that don't go too far beyond um, kind of the recommendations and the best practices. If you want to get creative, by, by all means, go for it. Um, but in general, I think best practice, know what the employers want. You can learn that from the job description. You can learn that from conversations with people at that company and just appeal to those needs the same way that businesses do. You know, when you look at a uh, McDonald's commercial, right? Or, or any type of food, right? Anytime they have a commercial on TV, they don't brag about how well their business is doing. They appeal to your needs. They show juicy dripping food and, <laughs> you know, delicious looking plates. They're appealing to your needs. So you have to start seeing these employers as your customers know what they want based on job descriptions, conversations, research on articles, new projects that companies are working on, and then appeal to that through um, your own experience that that's kind of my best recommendation i hope that answers your question yeah it does thank you yeah no problem okay so we're about out of time i know we sat here for two hours didn't really feel like that hopefully we can have some more um, just general conversations. I don't want us to always have to talk about um, strategy and career advice. Sometimes it's helpful for us to just connect. And that was really my big takeaway with this event was for everyone to stop seeing networking as like this means to an end, something I have to do to get a job. It's more so building genuine connections with people, building that trust so that when it does come time for a referral, it's easy to ask for that. But then also you should be trying your best to create mutually beneficial relationships with the people that you're, you're seeking help from. Um, I know obviously I, I would love to live in a world where everybody wanted to help without getting anything in return, um, but we, we don't. And sometimes we just don't have the time to, to help for free or help, you know, especially if we have multiple people pulling from us. So just try to make, um, try to make your relationships mutually beneficial, try to reciprocate, try to add value. Um, and I truly believe if you follow kind of that outline, you have a target of where you're going, you build genuine relationships with those people. I really truly believe that you'll start seeing more success in your job searches versus applying for jobs online. Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Go ahead. One last question. Uh, is it a good practice to ask for the endorsement on some skill set from, from others? I would say yes, but don't ask strangers. It's kind of weird. Um, 
you know, if you, if they don't know your work, it's weird for you to say, can you endorse, endorse my work for this? Um, so reach out to previous classmates, colleagues. Um, I mean, you could post it in Udacity. If you have people who are doing the same nano degree program, that can kind of help them justify doing it for you. But I wouldn't just reach out and, and ask randomly. I think that that's kind of strange. Um, but yeah, great question. So um, thank you all so, so much for joining. I really, really appreciate it. If you are interested, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, as I mentioned, I try my best to make sure that I'm having genuine conversations with people. So um, forgive me if it takes longer than, than normal to respond. Um, but yeah, please connect with me, connect with each other. And I know you all have access to, everybody has access to the alumni Slack channel, right? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay, um, good. So take advantage of that. You know, um, that, you know, Slack channels and different things have been some of the most relevant and helpful resources for me in my job searches. So it doesn't just have to be, you know, these live events where you're connecting with each other. Start conversations, spark them up. You don't have to wait for our team to post a question to start engaging. Um, he said, share the Slack channel. I would, so I'm going to uh, give you an email because um, I don't have access to that. So if you have any questions at all regarding kind of the career services, um, this is a great email to, to use career-support at udacity.com. Um, you can ask them for uh, access to that Slack channel if you don't already have it, but take advantage of that. Participate in the office hours, um, create topics for each other, private message each other, connect on LinkedIn, all these things. Um, you guys want to help each other out as much as possible. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Oh, I just got the pop up for the breakout rooms. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you all so, so much for attending. I really appreciate the, the engaging um, style. I, I really appreciate you all sharing and volunteering. And, and thank you all so much. If you have any further questions, I dropped the email there. Again, it's career-support at udacity.com. And hopefully we continue doing uh, similar events to this. So um, once again, thank you all for attending. I hope you have a great rest of your morning, day, evening, whatever that looks like for you. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks, Bert. Thanks for going over time. Thank you, Angel. Thank <clears throat> you.